I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And I had a patient who once fell asleep on the operating room table and the last thing they told me before they fell asleep was, Doc, that's not a date rape drug, is it? I had to pause what was going on because this is very serious. In addition to it being a trigger for me because this, I cannot take this lightly, I cannot let a patient fall asleep for an elective surgery with the concern of, is this the same medication that I may have gotten in the past that caused my body so much trauma that is still internalized in all of my nerves, in my muscles, in my heart and lungs. So we had to pause and we had to explain that what happened. I had to ask some questions about what the past was because if you fall asleep with that trauma on this table, there's a very real risk that it might come up while you're asleep or while you wake up or at any point in your recovery from that surgery because your body keeps score. So we're going to talk about what medications and anesthesia are compared to these unfortunately named date rape drugs. We're going to talk about drugs that are used to induce suggestibility in people like truth serum and what they all have in common so that you can be aware of how trauma can be in your body, how it can be revealed by medications and how you can hopefully prevent it from ever affecting your body that way. So this is a tough subject and I hope that you all appreciate that PTSD is very real even if you don't remember it. And that's why we're in the operating room because medications like propofol, similar to the gases that come out like out of this ventilator here, the laughing gas, this nitrous oxide, those all have similarities to medications that are used to nefariously sedate people so that terrible, horrible things might happen to them. Being taken advantage of promiscuously or sexually Maybe other physical traumas or verbal traumas can all happen. And if your brain is under the influence of such chemicals, other chemicals include antihistamines. Actually, we have a whole cart of similar medications. This one here is called diphenhydramine or AKA Benadryl. We have medications like this one called midazolam. It's a cousin of ropinol. We have medications like this called fentanyl, similar of course to other natural opioids. The most common drug, however, is not one that we usually use in medicine, is not one. Does anyone know what the most common drug is that can cause these horrible, horrible, influenceable thoughts that can allow people to be taken advantage of? And I'll give you a shout out because there is tremendous misunderstanding. It's not Tylenol. That's not one that's used to induce suggestibility or somebody may then be taken advantage of. Alcohol, yes, who said it here? Andrea Dingbat, you got it right. Alcohol is 100% the most common. And we don't have an appreciation for just how serious it is. We talk about benzodiazepines, Benadryl, these sedatives, Zolpidem, also called Ambien in the United States. But alcohol is number one. How about medications that are used to induce suggestibility? Meaning, you're in a hypnotic state where people might suggest concepts to you and you may, might be more likely to follow along. How heartbreaking is it when somebody is chemically put into a state like this? And then the idea floated that, oh, maybe we should try this activity together. Something that ordinarily would never be appropriate, but because somebody is chemically altered where their frontal lobe is turned off, their executive function is impaired. They're literally sedated. That's what these medications do in the operating room. And the reason this matters, even if the medications are different, the chemicals are different, and there are differences. For example, scopolamine is used often in these outside surgery settings. We use scopolamine for some purposes in the operating room. It's easy and relatively cheap, which is why it's used nefariously. It comes from a plant, the Datura plant. But it still shares the same thread 
of potentially putting somebody in a trauma. And when you're in a trauma, no matter how much scopolamine, Benadryl or diphenhydramine, midazolam, fentanyl, alcohol, even if you are not aware fully consciously of what is going on to your body, whether you're on the operating room table or being taken advantage of in one of these very serious settings, your body keeps score. How do we know this? How do we know that your body keeps score? Well, for one, if you come to me in the operating room like that patient who looked at me and had that terror in her eyes, literally, is that the drug that was used in a date rape? Maybe it was their date rape. We didn't go into specifics, but the point is that it brought up changes that you can see on the monitors here behind me. All these monitors here, these life support monitors are like a window to your body. They absolutely respond to triggers of past traumas. These are embedded. They're not permanently embedded, but unless they are actively addressed, they are embedded in your body, in your muscles, and all the nerves that go into your heart, like we said. In your lungs, of course, your brain. They can lead to anxieties and panic attacks, which come up under anesthesia, that are a testament to how real they are. They can show up in your vital signs, in how much you sweat, in how much, how dilated your pupils are, what your heart is doing. It can impact how much anesthesia you need because that wound up central nervous system can increase your anesthesia requirements. And the more anesthesia you need, it's apparent because it's like, wow, why is this individual who only weighs a certain number of pounds or kilograms, they're using a disproportionate amount of anesthesia to not move during surgery, to not react to the surgical stimulus. These are all examples that the body is wound up. We have other names for this. These traumas that happen, even if you don't remember them, they persist. For example, after surgery, you can have the parts of your body that are awake during anesthesia, like parts of your spinal cord that are the most resistant to anesthesia, they can literally be wound up so that the smallest trigger, boom, will cause them to explode in their neurochemical release. Practically, it means that a small stimulus, like a pinch, might lead to an exaggerated pain response or pain perception by the brain, which is what you feel as pain in the end. So if you're under anesthesia, and maybe you have some awareness, but your brain doesn't fully remember it because you're sedated, just like these, I mean, these victims of these horrible, horrible, call them date rapes, I mean, these are just like unconsciousable things, right? Even if they don't remember fully what happened, they will have the risk for having that trauma built in. Just like children who may not have their hippocampus fully absorbing data and being consolidated throughout their brain to remember adverse childhood experiences, these persist. Whether it's because your brain isn't developed or because you're under the influence of medications that are preventing memories from being developed, your body keeps score and it's very real. I wanted to mention that there's a couple other similarities here that, um, that all of these have together. When individuals, and this is really serious, right? Um, oh, thank you. Karen, I, I appreciate that super thanks. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Remember, if you um, leave a super thanks, you're more than welcome to leave a specific question and it pops up easily for me to see and I'm, of course, happy to give priority to those questions. I do need to emphasize a couple things though because this influences so much of how that trauma gets into your body in the first place, literally, gets under your skin to impair your memory consolidation because a traumatic experience can be consolidated like any ordinary memory, in which case it doesn't lead to PTSD and flashbacks, or it can be consolidated incorrectly, where every time you get triggered or it's accessed, it's like you're reliving it. These are two different ways that memories can be encoded or what we call consolidated in the brain. When we are in states of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, we are likely more at risk of having a traumatic experience 
be encoded in such a way that it leads to PTSD in the future. Compared to states where we have adequate self-confidence, we have confidence, I'm sorry, self-esteem, we have adequate self-esteem, we have confidence, we have certainty, and we have at least the feeling or the appreciation of control over our internal and external world. Some of it is perceived control, it's not always there. Uh, but when we have those, I call them the three C's, certainty, control, and confidence, and you can throw in self-esteem, we are less likely to fall victim to these traumatic experiences from ever happening in the first place. And if they do, reduce the risk of them becoming consolidated in an impaired way that can lead to PTSD in the future. Even when your brain can't remember what happened because you were under the influence of the ropinol or, I mean, we don't really use chloroform, but you can imagine all these horrendous drugs that people have exploited others for in these unconsciousable actions. We can at least try to minimize the risk that that might turn into something that has even more deleterious consequences. Uh, Andrea Taylor, thank you for that kind super thanks. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, the body keeps score. It's why we're here in the operating room because this is the ultimate place in the world where more traumas happen than anywhere else where our bodies open up in ways that they never open up anywhere else. If you appreciate me coming in here after a long day in the operating room, do please hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. Your support helps me do this more often. We operate, we all live in this very sick healthcare system. And my patients don't feel empowered to speak up, just like the patient that looked me in the eye in that last moment. It had not come up with their surgeon, had not come up with their nurse, had not come up with me when I called them the night before their surgery. It's in that moment of intense vulnerability that they spoke up. And I am so grateful that they spoke up so that we could hit the brakes to address what happened. So instead of letting water roll over the dam that could cause a flashback, a panic attack, a setup for future major depression after their surgery, that we could actually not only raise the dam higher, but rather than suppress those emotions like raising the dam higher to prevent water from flooding, lower the water level by compassionately listening, eliciting questions, showing curiosity about what this fellow human being has gone through. And in this moment of intense vulnerability, giving them as much external support as possible so that should the traumatic experience happen, it is less likely to lead to those long-term psychological consequences. In some cases in the elderly, it may even lead to delirium and cognitive problems. We don't yet know, but given the loneliness epidemic that we talked about last week, there is significant concern that these things are overlapped and what we call multifactorial. If you appreciate that message, please share it with others to empower others to advocate for themselves in this healthcare system so that they don't need to suffer the way that that patient had suffered. Closed in in their cells, not up until the last minute. And I gotta say, there's many other cases, I don't, I don't wanna throw any other colleagues under the bus or any other doctors, but in many cases, another individual may have just pushed the propofol instead of paused to address what's going on. Not because they're bad doctors or bad people, but because there is a reality that medicine is like a meat packing factory. Patients are just on a conveyor belt. We prescribe pills to get them out of here. And that is not empowering because that is building your dam higher. If you had PTSD arising from an event, especially one when you were asleep or sedated, we need to dig into your subconscious to connect the dots of that PTSD experience when you're sedated because your brain is not properly forming those memories. You, and this is why this can go for years undiagnosed because patients can't figure out what the inciting trauma was. So when you can reach out to fellow friends, whoever, when you see it in their eyes, the creases around their eyes, 
the creases between their eyebrows, their forehead. These, these are telltale signs that any one of us can learn to not only be empathetic, but to be present. That presence can help give the external support that so many others need. Whether you're an anesthesiologist seeing patients who need the external support, or it's any one of your friends or family, you have that power not only to heal yourself, but to help heal others. So if you've appreciated that, please remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told.